not another one. When is it ever going to end, he thought. The insults, the ridicule, the scorn, the genuine hatred. What did he do to deserve it? And is there anything he could do to stop it? His boss had prepared him for this. But, but really, who could prepare for this kind of abuse? He thought about the fact that his, his boss, he made a deal with his boss not to fight back, not to appear shaken. Don't let him see you sweat. Don't let him see you sneer. Respond with dignity. Keep your composure. He thought about how his mother had taught him the same thing. His mother, the epitome of grace. Single mom, raising five kids, very low income, low paying job, but no complaints. Nary a one. Was the abuse that he endured any more difficult than the life that she lived? Probably not. But did, did that make it any easier? No. What made it easier was the dream that if he could take it, maybe, just maybe, those who came after him wouldn't have to. And so day after day, city after city, park after park, he committed to doing his job well. No, he committed to being the best so that there would be no argument, no debate as to whether or not he belonged. We're in a series called Heroes, studying men and women of great faith, even some of not so great faith, just a little faith, but they relied on God with their faith. And God did incredible things through them, not women and men who were perfect, but truly heroes because they relied on their faith. And today's hero is no different, except that you never hear that faith was the key part and the key component of his story, ever. That's kept out of the history books. Being a Christian is not politically correct. Even if you occupy an exalted place in our culture, which this hero certainly does, he probably did more to influence the civil rights movement than any one man, including Martin Luther King. That's because the political arena is not near as important to us as the sports arena. Our politics are not near as important to us as our games. And this man changed our national pastime. His name was Jackie Robinson. And he was the first player, the first player, the first black man ever to play Major League Baseball. And it was his faith in God and his reliance on the words of Christ that propelled him to break down the racial barriers. And that shouldn't surprise us at all. With people like William Wilberforce, the British politician who ended the slave trade. With people like Abraham Lincoln, the president who drafted the Emancipation Proclamation. With people like Frederick Douglass, the slave who led the abolitionist movement. With people like Harriet Tubman, the slave who was a key player in the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad, which used Christian churches to move black people out of the South. Rosa Parks, the lady who calmly refused to sit at the back of the bus. Martin Luther King, the pastor who used nonviolent reasoning and love instead of violence to break the chains of segregation. What do these champions of racial justice all have in common? One thing, their faith. They were all Christians, strong Christians, as was Jackie Robinson. And I got to tell you, I don't know why we don't say that more often in our churches. We should. I mean, I, I know our culture wants us to keep our faith in private, but when do we start taking our marching orders from our culture? If nothing else, our kids need to hear why these great men and women were able to stand against the tide and face enormous adversity to change human history. Why? Their faith. Amen? Their faith. That's what did it. Their strength came from their knowledge of God's will. Their strategy came from an understanding of God's ways. Their success came from a reliance on God. And that's what Jackie Robinson was all about. Jack Roosevelt Robinson was born in 1919 in Cairo, Georgia. He was the fifth child of a daughter of a slave. 
His mother admired President Teddy Roosevelt so much because he was a Christian and a man against racial inequality that she named her son after him. Jackie's mother and father were sharecroppers on a southern plantation. Now, sharecropping, all that is, if you don't know, you read it in books and sometimes you don't even know what that is. Sharecropping means you don't own the land that you plant on. It's your plant, you go to somebody else's plant, you plant it, you take some and you give the owner of the land some. Sharecropping, hence the word. And many blacks at that time were sharecroppers with white landowners. Why? Because blacks never could afford the land. They were kept in it, kept down. It was impossible for them to own their own land. It was a time when segregation ruled the South. The Jim Crow laws, which were state and local laws mandating segregation of all public facilities, they had been put in place in the late 1800s and lasted for years, decades. Just by way of history, if you're wondering who Jim Crow was, Jim Crow's not a real person. Jim Crow's actually a character in a play. And the play was this guy named Jim Crow, and it was a white man with black face on playing this, th this part. And Jim Crow was a character that stood for segregation. And that is the environment in which Jackie Robinson was born. Let's just say it was difficult. And let me tell you something that was more difficult. His father left when he was three months old. And his mother's in the South, in a segregated South. And she knew that there was no future for her children in the South. So she began saving money, pennies at a time, to move herself and her family across the country to Pasadena, California. And the journey in a Jim Crow train, segregated train, took nine days. But Jackie's mom found employment as a maid working long hours to feed her family. And she never exhibited bitterness or resentment for her life or the things that happened to her. In fact, just the opposite. Jackie wrote that his mom spent every hour she wasn't working teaching her kids about optimism, about family, about self-discipline, and above all, the strength and the hope and the joy of her Christian faith. It was her faith that when the Robinsons discovered that the West had its share of racists just like the South did, and their neighborhood, the people in their neighborhood, their white neighbors, tried to get them out of the neighborhood. It was her faith that gave her the strength and the dignity and kindness that eventually won her neighbors over. His mom killed them with kindness, literally. And Jackie took note. And she made sure he took note. In fact, one time Jackie and his friends retaliated for a white man's slur against them by vandalizing the white man's house. And he didn't get caught, except by his mother, who found out and took Jackie and every one of his friends and marched him over to that white man's place and made him apologize to the white man and repair the damage they had done in the vandalism and stayed there until it was repaired. She believed in what the Bible taught, that Christians should bless those who persecute them. She showed Jackie what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, that's certainly the opposite of conventional wisdom, would you not say? Jackie thought so, too, and didn't really pay much attention to it. He was too busy playing sports anyway. And his athletic abilities were apparent from a very early age. In high school, he lettered in four sports, football, basketball, baseball, and track. He entered the Pacific Coast Junior Tennis Tournament, and he won. Seriously? A black man in the 1920s and 30s playing tennis. He won. In college, at Pacific Coast Junior College and then at UCLA, he was the starting quarterback in football, the point guard in basketball, a sprinter and a long jumper in track, and the most valuable player as a shortstop on the baseball team. But as Jackie got into college and was on away trips and all that stuff, he ran into racism and segregation all over the place. 
and he was turned away at hotels and turned away at restaurants, and he often struggled to control his temper. He got into more than a few skirmishes, and on one occasion, he ended up spending the night in jail. Finally, a young pastor at Jackie's church, a guy named Carl Downs, a man who uh, Jackie really looked up to, really admired, he started talking to him about the Christian response to injustice. He said that the Christian response is, is one of dignity and kindness, and it wasn't submissive at all. On the contrary, he said it was heroic. He, he said that it's easy to, to lash out. That's where our emotions naturally take us. That's easy. That's what everybody does. But to have the self-discipline to control your emotions and take the high road, he said that's the stuff of champions. Then he took Jackie to a place in the Bible. It was Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he showed him Matthew 5. He says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what Jackie's mom said. Sure, she said the same thing to him, but you know how it is, right? Parental wisdom is okay, but it's always nice to hear it from somebody else, isn't it? Your kids, like, hear the same thing from you, but they hear it from somebody else, and they're always going, Mom, Dad, I heard this, and I really caught on. Man, I've been saying you that for years. <laughs> and that's what it was for Jackie, too. And Jackie started to realize that maybe the path to justice isn't one with fists and fury but with love and restraint. And he talked it over with a young, beautiful nursing student at UCLA named Rachel. And he was head over heels for her. And she not only shared his faith in Christ, but she had an answer to how racial injustice should be attacked. And she brought a Bible to Jackie's room. And they opened up the Bible and she turned to Matthew 5. And she read to Jackie, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jackie by now was a little suspect. First his mom, then his pastor, now his girlfriend. Was this a conspiracy? This love your enemies things started to take hold. And he thought about it a lot as he continued his studies at UCLA and continued his attention-getting performance in athletics. He became the first UCLA athlete to letter in four sports. But much to his, Rachel's chagrin and his mother's chagrin, he left UCLA without graduating, thinking that academics wasn't the way, that he was so much better in sports that he'd try sports, even though at that time, Major League Sports, most of them were segregated. And he left UCLA, and he went to Honolulu to join the Honolulu Bears, a semi-pro football team. But the Honolulu Bears football experiment was short-lived, and he started missing his family and Rachel and left the team. And maybe that was a God thing. Because you know the date he left the Honolulu Bears? December 5th, 1941. Some of you might know that date. He left two days before Pearl Harbor. In fact, he was on the boat still. He was on the boat going back to California when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Maybe that was a God thing. And with the war on, Jackie was immediately drafted into Uncle Sam's segregated army. He became an expert marksman, and he passed all the tests for officer, officer candidate school, and eventually he did receive his officer's commission. However, this did not stop the injustice. This did not stop the barrage of insults and obstacles that were put in front of him by his white officers, his white superior officers including an attempt to court-martial him for willful disobedience because one time when they were going into town, he would not sit at the back of the bus. He wanted to sit with the other officers, of which he was one. And they drove him up on a court-martial. Fortunately, Jackie was found not guilty 
when several character witnesses marched into the courtroom. White character witnesses, including his colonel of his unit, who said Jackie is an unbelievable, an outstanding officer and an outstanding soldier, and very respected by all the enlisted men he leads. And Jackie got off. But looking back, it seemed that these experiences were most likely God's way of preparing Jackie for what was to come. In effect, it was like the spiritual spring training, and he was now going into the big leagues. For shortly after he was honorably discharged from the Army in 1944, he joined the Negro Baseball League. And while there, he received a phone call, a phone call that was never expected, a call from Brooklyn, New York. You see, Brooklyn was the home of the Dodgers, and the Dodgers were one of the premier teams in Major League Baseball. And at that time, like the South and like the Army, baseball was segregated, no black players. But Brooklyn had an unusual owner. Anybody know his name? Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey was the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Rickey had tons of energies. And he was an unusual guy, but he was always bringing new ideas to his beloved sport of baseball. He brought in the batting cages. He brought in the batting helmets. He started the farm league system. Pretty good idea. But his most important contribution was a personal one. He could not stand that Major League Baseball was segregated. He wanted to see it integrated so bad. You see, Ricky was a devout Christian. And he understood that God created us all equal. To him, leaving black players out of the game simply for being black, well, that was an abomination to God. And don't miss that. At the center of one of the most important events in civil rights history in America were two strong Christians, Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey. And Rickey, he wore his faith on his sleeve. Jackie was kind of a this, let's just say didn't talk too much. Just was a strong, silent type. Ricky, man, you knew he was a Christian. His decision-making process was always biblically directed, including he refused to play on Sundays. He refused to even attend games of other team on Sundays. And it was his faith that led him to find a black ball player to integrate Major League, ball players, major league uh, Baseball. So even though the vast majority of owners were dead set against the idea of integrating baseball, his decision wasn't if he should do it or even when he should do it. His decision was, how should I do it to make sure it sticks? How can I do it in a way that will get everybody on board? And an idea, an inspiration, jolted him like an inside fastball. Ricky not only needed the first back player to be a really good baseball player that fans would want to watch, someone who, who ran and fielded and hit and threw, just as good as any white player, he needed someone with strong Christian character that when the predictable insults and abuse came, that he would respond with dignity and poise and kindness. Ricky felt strongly that if the player he chose for this extraordinary task could be goaded into doing something ridiculous, into fighting, into to lashing back, that nobody would take him. That everybody would say, you know what, this is not good. And, and the black man would receive the blame, because that's how it usually happened in life. He had to be sure that he was choosing someone who understood the tremendous significance and strength of not fighting back. So he quietly sent out his spies, his, his scouts, looking into the Negro Leagues for just the right player. And on August of 1945, his search ended. And he set his sights on a shortstop who played for the Kansas City Monarchs, Jackie Robinson. And the phone call from the Dodgers organization to Jackie set off a series of events that immediately had him traveling to New York to, with a meeting set up with Branch Rickey. Except that Jackie, they didn't tell him what it was about. He had no idea what it was, what it was about. And Mr. Rickey's first question to him sure didn't shed any light. His first question to Jackie was this, do you have a girlfriend? Jackie's like, that's an odd way to start a conversation. Then Ricky proceeded to say that Jackie would be facing real challenges ahead. And the love and respect of a good woman, a good wife, 
would be very important. Amen to that, men? Amen. Jackie said, what are you talking about? And Ricky said, don't you know why you're here? And Jackie said, well, I thought you wanted me to play for Brooklyn's Negro team. And Mr. Ricky said, no, no, no. I want you to play for the Dodgers. And Jackie was stunned. And he was even more speechless than he usually is. He didn't know what to say. So Ricky continued. He said, we're going to start you in our farm system in Montreal. But if you do good there, I promise you, we'll bring you up, and you'll pray and book them for the Dodgers. Now, I don't think any of us here could remotely imagine what was going through Jackie Robinson's mind at that time when he got told that he was going to be the first black player in the major leagues because he understood the deeply held prejudices that people carried around. He also understood the anger that his own race had toward years and years and years of injustice. And Branch Rickey had just told him that he'd be thrust into the epicenter of it all. I believe only a hero would accept that challenge. I believe only a Christian would make it successful. Amen? And Jackie did. And Branch Rickey believed that same thing. He explained to Jackie that if, when he became Major League Baseball's first black player, that he was in for significant abuse, both verbal and physical. And Ricky said this to him in that first meeting. He said, I know you're a good ball player. That's not, that's not the point. I want to know if you have guts. And Jackie's response was this. He, he said, I'm not afraid of anybody. I can handle myself in a fight. And Ricky said, yeah, but I'm looking for someone with enough guts not to fight. Not to fight. And then he opened a book that he was reading at that time. It was on his table. It's called The Life of Christ. True story. And he turned to the page where it discussed Christ's Sermon on the Mount. And the writer called it the most revolutionary of any teaching in history. And Mr. Ricky read from the sermon itself. Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said. With me. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. If someone forces you to go one mile, that's right. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, yeah. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been a time in your life where God keeps bringing things up over and over and over again? And you feel like the dumbest person ever. God, why are you keeping doing this? This is coming back. This same verse, this same person, this, this, is, this same subject keeps coming back over and over again. What is it, God? Jackie felt the same way. First his mom, then his pastor, then his girl, now the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers. All the same passage. Jackie must have thought, really, God, of all the passages in the whole Bible, you give me this one? You saddle me with this one? The, the hardest of Jesus' teaching? the most revolutionary of Jesus' teaching? Love your enemies? Why don't you give me don't cast swine or don't cast uh, pearls before swine? I can do that one probably, right? But love your enemies? Pray for those who persecute you? I, I got to believe that's what he was thinking. But Jackie knew that Mr. Ricky was right, that the kind of person, the only way that this experiment wouldn't blow up was for him to love his enemies, no matter how hard it would be. And so he accepted the challenge, and it was hard. In fact, before the meeting ever ended, a little side note, this is the first meeting that Branch Rickey had with Jackie Robinson. He went through a role play with Jackie, and he started calling Jackie every name in the book, racial name. And he, and he played the part of the hotel clerk, the rude hotel clerk, refusing Jackie's accommodations. And he played the part of the restaurant, refusing to serve a hungry Jackie after a ball game. And he played a part of a foul-mouthed opponent, calling Jackie every name under the sun. And Jackie remembered asking God for the strength not to fight back, because he knew he didn't have the strength on his own. And so the deal was signed. And Jackie went to Montreal, where he proved himself to be a great player and a great man, with God's calming hand. 
His first game, Jackie went four for four with a three-run homer, four runs scored, three RBIs, and two stolen bases. Those of you who know baseball, pretty good, right? Not bad. Not bad. That year, he won the batting title. This is his first year with a 349 average. Montreal won the most games they ever did in team history, and they won the minor league pennant by a whopping 18 and a half games. Second place was 18 and a half games behind. On the dignity front, Jackie and Rachel got married and together endured a barrage of verbal attacks and slurs at every single game. In some cities, they couldn't find a restaurant to serve them. They were bumped from flights with no explanation of why and made to ride the bus to the next town that they were playing in. 14, 15, 16 hours in the back of a bus while everybody else on their team took a flight. But no complaining. No testy press conferences. No justifiable boorish behavior. In every way, Jackie Robinson vindicated Branch Rickey's historic decision. And after one season in Montreal, Jackie Robinson was brought up to the big leagues and began his career with the Brooklyn Dodgers. A career that saw him lead the league every year in steals, play in numerous All-Star games, win multiple awards, including Rookie of the Year and MVP, have a lifetime batting average of well over 300, win the World Series in 1955 against his crosstown rivals, the Yankees. That was probably the biggest feat of all. And he got elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame. But it's what he had to endure that took him from great baseball player to hero. From the first game, the word nigger, the word boy, the word jungle man, and things I can't even repeat, they were commonplace for him to hear, even from his teammates. In one game, a player deliberately dug his spikes into Jackie's leg and had a seven-inch gash. He had to be taken to the hospital. In another game, the opposing manager walked down to the, out into the field while Jackie was hitting and started screaming racial slurs at him while he was hitting. And Jackie did nothing. He looked straight ahead at the pitcher and hit the ball for a double and stole third, stole home, and scored. Didn't even look at the manager when he walked into the dugout. Later, as more and more people were watching Jackie's dignity and how he handled himself, they started coming over to his side. So that same manager came under pressure to bury the hatchet publicly with Jackie because everybody knew what the names that he had been called by this manager of the Phillies. And Jackie didn't balk. He didn't hold the grudge. He forgave. He forgave. And even posed for a famous picture together with him right there. Now, the manager didn't want to shake Jackie's hand or even touch Jackie, so they had to take a bat. And Jackie didn't say a word. But through all the separate hotels and restaurants and insults and abuse and death threats, Jackie remained the person of honor he committed he would be to Mr. Ricky and to God. He literally loved his enemy, and God blessed that obedience. His teammates quickly moved to his side. In fact, in one game where Jackie took the field amid a, a chorus of boos, Hall of Fame shortstop who was on his team, Pee Ree Reese, came over and put his arm around Jackie and stood there with his arm around Jackie until the boos stopped because everybody loved Pee Ree Reese. And Pee Ree Reese loved his teammate, Jackie Robinson. And that gesture has been immortalized with a statue that stands in Brooklyn today that you can see. And the fans, after watching this man of dignity and grace, they came to love him too. They, uh, they couldn't help but love him, especially the kids, except the boy that's standing in his knee. I don't know if he loves him or not. He's... But everybody else loved him. And they didn't even wait until after the game to try to get his autograph. There are picture after picture of Jackie during the game, and his teammates are going, oh, brother. And the kids are climbing on the dugout. They can't wait to get Jackie Robinson's autograph. He became the most popular player in Major League Baseball. And today, every year, on April 15th, which is the first day that Jackie Robinson stepped onto the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers, 
Every player, where's his number? Number 42. Every player in baseball today. In honor of this Christian hero. And besides that one day, no one in baseball can wear the number 42. It is the only number retired by every single major league team in honor of this Christian hero, Jackie Robinson. And a few years ago, they made a movie called 42 in honor of Jackie. But the movie didn't honor Jackie because it left out the reason and the strength behind his decision to break the color barrier. Not surprising. And it added scenes like Jackie breaking his bat against a wall in the dugout in anger and then cursing God. A scene which never happened. But it's good for Hollywood. And it made Branch Rickey's faith a joke. And he used his faith to tell funny stories. And they made Rickey's decision to bring Jackie into baseball one of profit and self-glory and championships. Risky, Ricky got asked time and time in the movie, why did you bring Jackie to do it? Hey, good money, good for business. Ricky never said that in his life. He did it because of his Christian faith. And now our culture ties violent mo movements, like Black Lives Matter, and they tie it to Jackie Robinson. And disrespectful protests, like kneeling for the national anthem, and then minutes later in a press conference honoring murdering dictators, like Fidel Castro, and, Ma and hateful revolutionaries like Malcolm X. And they equate that with what Jackie did. Should we be surprised? No. Jackie would be the first person to denounce this garbage. You say, well, how do you know that? Because he did. Because he did. You see, he loved his enemies, but loving your enemies doesn't mean, you know what, I have to agree with my enemies. And when Malcolm X, who lived alongside Jackie Robinson, came out and started doing what he did, a hateful person who despised any color except black, whether you're white, Mexican, whatever, Jackie talked about it. And Malcolm X didn't approve of Jackie's criticism. And blasted Robinson for coming out and saying, that's not how to do it. And that's not what I'm about. So I'm in solid ground when I say Jackie Robinson would look at today and say, that's not what I'm about. And then he would quote Matthew 5. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. My prayer is that we become a church obedient to the words of Christ. Words that became actions when Christ went on the cross and died for each of us, each of us who has rejected him. And Jesus made those words a reality. He loved his enemies. He prayed for people who persecuted. He died for people who persecuted him. And those words of Jesus inspired heroes like Abraham Lincoln and Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks and Jackie Robinson. Love her enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Big challenge, much bigger impact. Let's pray.